Welcome or welcome back. We are so glad you've chosen to join us today for Church Online. My name is Mitchell DeWare and I'm the senior pastor here at APBC. And just as we begin today, I have two quick things I wanna share with you about today's online experience. First of all, if you are brand new with us, we would love to be able to connect with you. So I wanna encourage you to go ahead and reach out to us by sending us a message on Facebook Messenger. And you can do that through our page at facebook.com slash APB church. Or you can go ahead and send me an email directly at mitchell.theware at gmail.com. Second thing today is if you have found us on Facebook, I'd encourage you to go ahead and like and follow our page as that's the best way for you to keep up with everything going on here at APBC. But as well, if you find what we're doing engaging and helpful, I'd encourage you to go ahead and share that content as well. And whether you are brand new to faith or you've been around for a long, long time, we hope that today's message both encourages and inspires you in taking your next step in trusting in and following Jesus. Well, today's message uh, needs some special introduction. As many of you know, I'm away on vacation this weekend, spending some much needed time away with my family. And I've asked Reverend Craig Minard from New Heights Baptist Church uh, to share a message with us this morning. And I hope that it does indeed encourage and inspire you. Here's my good friend, Craig. As Paul is writing to the Thessalonians about the coming of Jesus, um, he reminds them in the first few chapters to have hope in the Lord Jesus, um, to be reminded that our hope is in the things to come. Not only is our hope in the things that have taken place, but our hope is in the things to come, and that is Christ Jesus, the return of Jesus, and how he will descend from heaven like a thief in the night, Thessalonians says. And when we come to our passage this morning, we come to Paul's final instructions in light of Jesus' return. And as we come to verse 12, he, he says, we ask you brothers to respect those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. First of all, Peter or Paul reminds them to um, to respect those that are working, to respect those that are not only working in communities and, and working as in, in Genesis, it tells us that we are to work um, and not to be idle. Uh, and as those that are also being called to work in the kingdom, he says, respect those that are laboring among you, um, lift them up, hold them up. And he says also those that admonish you. And to, to admonish you is to those who um, caution you, to those who give you advice, to those who counsel you um, against uh, things. Admonish those. So he, Paul calls to make sure that you respect them. And to respect is to have admiration for, to esteem them, um, to set them apart. And so... In the weight of the return of Jesus, Paul says, respect those that God has placed in leadership, those that are working among you, uh, those keeping you accountable. Um, and then, of course, we see in verse 13 where it says, and esteem them very highly in love because of their work, to hold them high, to esteem them, um, to respect them, and then it says to be peace with them, which might suggest that there were some tensions um, in the church. Um, some people um, don't want to be led, um, and so it becomes very hard. And we know that as we've come out of First Peter, and where we see that Paul again is uh, telling them that uh, they need to submit to the authorities, to submit to those that God has placed in leadership positions and. Paul reminds them in the last days and uh, to be aware that you must respect your, those that labor among you and those that um, have been uh, placed in leadership and to love them and to be at peace amongst each other, to recognize that God has put a structure in place for the furtherance of his kingdom and the furtherance of this land. And so when Paul goes into verse 14 and he says, And we urge you, brothers, there, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, um, help the weak, and be patient with them all. 
Um, he begins to talk about those who um, are idle, those who are doing nothing, um, those that are just sitting back and not doing anything because they think Jesus is going to return right away, or those that are just sitting back and letting everybody else do the work. They're idle. And Paul says to warn them that you are not to be idle, that you are not to be not doing anything. I love in Acts when the ascension of Jesus and Jesus is lifted up and ascends back into heaven and the angels says to them, what are you doing still standing here? In other words, go about the business of the Lord. Go about fulfilling the great commission. Uh, don't just wait around and, and think that Jesus is going to return away. Jesus has work for you to do and he has left you work and he has left us all work. Work in the kingdom and work to be done in his name. And so Paul warns against those who are not working and, and tells it to advise them not to be that way. To, to use your gifts, use your skills in the kingdom. To, to be busy about the Father's business and encourage the faint-hearted. Again, we've just come out of 1 Peter. We see a lot of uh, suffering. We see a lot of persecution. Uh, we look around our world. We see that. We see that uh, not only in small amounts of it in the land in which we live, but if we look around the world, we see all of that. And in the faint heart, it, it could be just some of them are wore out. Some of them wore out from the persecution. Some of them are wore out from the illnesses that they have. Some have become weak, whether it's physically weak or they've been uh, uh, just weak in their conscience. And, and so Paul says, encourage them uh, to ed lift them up, to, uh, to be able to advise them and encourage those that are faint hearted, those who are weak and be patient with them, love them, lift them up in your prayers. And then, of course, we get to verse 15, that, that, uh, that verse that I think we've all learned as ch children, that two wrongs don't make a right. Do not repay evil for evil, but instead always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. That should be a Christian's life. Don't do evil to someone who does evil to you, but love them and, and do what is good not only to one another, but to everyone. Not only to those that are Christians, but to the whole world. Love them and do good unto them, because that's what God has commanded us to do. So we see this, the two wrongs don't make a right, to love one another. And then, of course, we get into this verse 16. Through all of this, as we, as we encourage one another, as we submit to the leadership, uh, Paul says, as we're waiting for Jesus, remember this in verse 16, rejoice always. To rejoice always. That hymn that we sang, we've sung as kids or as we are growing up, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say what? I say rejoice. Be glad. But this only can happen if our joys do not come from circumstances in life, but rather a joy that is found in a deep commitment that is in the Lord Jesus that's based on truth and trust and faith. That's where we, our joy comes from as Christians. If our joy is hinged on events, if our joy is hinged on circumstances in this life, we will always have a hard time to be happy and to praise the Lord and to rejoice. But for a Christian, if what is our joy is found in the relationship and fellowship that we have with the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is based on the fact that he is true, that he is the Son of God, and it is based on faith, then it is rock solid. It goes nowhere. And for the Christian, through all circumstances in life, we should be able to rejoice because that never changes. Jesus never changes. He is always there. He never leaves us, never forsakes us. And he walks with us. He encourages us. He strengthens us. And therefore, we should be able to rejoice no matter what the world throws against us. No matter what 2020 throws against us, we as Christians should be able to rejoice and to be glad because it's not hinged in things of this world, but hinged in our relationship and our fellowship with Jesus. 
And in that rejoicing, Paul says in 16, rejoice always. He says, because we are rejoicing always, pray without ceasing. Which means to pray with no time gap in between our prayers. It, it kind of ties in with our midweek that we went and looked at. That in all things we should bring glory to God, but in all things we should do with prayer and supplication to never give up. Luke 18 verse 1 says, always pray and not lose heart. Our life should be a life of continual prayer without ceasing, without reduction, but constantly praying in all things. Again, as I said on Thursday, it's a tall task but it's the one that we're called to as Christians. The other thing too is, is if we continue to pray and continue to commune with the Lord, it is easier not to fall into the temptations of this world. It's when we leave Jesus and we wander away from Jesus that we become tempted with the things of this world where they become more important and that we want to do them rather than following Jesus. But if we pray without ceasing, if we continue in a fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ in prayer, then the temptations would go away a lot easier. It is a prayer without ceasing that helps us to be able to rejoice always. It's the prayer without ceasing, without interruption, that helps us to be able to rejoice always always because we are in his presence and we are speaking with him all the time. In verse 18, Paul goes on and says, not only are we to rejoice always and not only are we to pray without ceasing, but I think this other one comes through the rejoicing always and the pray ceasing. If we're forever praying and if we're ever rejoicing, we should be forever, as Paul says in 18, giving thanks in all circumstances. We as Christians should be always thankful because our God is an awesome God. Our God is worthy of our praise. Our God is great and greatly to be praised he is. And because our God is great, we should always be rejoicing. We should always be praying and we should always be giving thanks in all circumstances. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Psalms 147 and verse 5 says, Great is our Lord and abundant in prayer. His understanding is beyond measure. There are three things that hinge together here. Prayer, rejoicing, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, prayer, rejoicing. Rejoicing, thanksgiving, prayer, and rejoicing. That they hinge together. And we see in 1 Thessalonians, and, and we see 5 verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances, no matter what they are, no matter what you seem to be facing, we should be giving thanks. Why? Because our God is great. Our God is awesome. Our God is to be thanked. Ephesians 5 20 says, give thanks always for everything. Everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In all circumstances, Thessalonians 5.18, Ephesians 5, in everything, in everything, in all circumstances, we should be giving thanks. From our scriptures, it is obvious that God wants to, uh, the gratitude from us, he wants us to be thankful, he wants us to understand where all of our blessings come from. And as we want to give him gratitude and as we want to give him praise, God wants us to be thankful. He wants our thankfulness to come from our person, from our personal life. In, in other words, he's concerned for us. And so as we come and as we are thankful, our, our thanksgiving should be personal. It is what God um, sees in us and as we bring before God. He doesn't want general. He wants us to be personal. He wants us to be open with him. The amazing thing is, is that God knows everything about us anyway. So, so we don't have to pretend. We don't have to hide because he sees it. And so he just wants us to be thankful. And he also wants it to be not only personal. He wants our praise to be perpetual. He wants it at all times. 
Not just on Sunday morning, not just for this hour, not for this afternoon, but constantly from his children. He wants it to be personal, perpetual, and pervasive. In other words, for all things, in all circumstances. And again, when we do this, and as we pray about it, and we cease and never cease to pray, then we rejoice. We see in, in Luke, in chapter 17, and uh, beginning at verse 12, uh, we see that Jesus cleanses the ten lepers, and it says, On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. And he lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. In verse 17, then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return to give praise to God except for this foreigner? And he said to them, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. But notice there's ten of them. God blesses ten of them. But only one comes back and gives thanks to Jesus. And he says, where's the other ones? Were there not ten, but there's only one? And not only one, it's not even a Jew. It's not even one of my chosen people. It's someone from outside. And Jesus says, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. And he wants our thankfulness. And there's so many things for us to be thankful for. The first thing is, is we should be thankful because our God is so great, is to be thankful that he has a plan. Uh, Proverbs 16 and verse 9 says, The heart of the man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. In Jeremiah 29, 11 and 12, that verse that we all know so well, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for our welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will what? You will call upon my name and come and pray to me and I will hear you. Again, that sense of having a plan for us, but not only having a plan for us, that we would call upon his name and that we would come before him and praying without ceasing. Praying without ceasing. Thanksgiving. Prayer, which brings us to rejoicing. Many times when we have plans, they don't materialize. We feel like there's something wrong. But sometimes when our plans fail, it's because they aren't God's plans for us. And I think we could all think of circumstances um, for that. Uh, things that we really, really wanted, they didn't work out, we got really upset. But maybe when we look back at it, we looked at it and say, you know what, that wouldn't have been such a great idea because we didn't know that this was going to happen. Because God has a plan for us. And we should be thankful that God has a plan for us. We should be thankful and praise Him that He has a plan for each and every one of our lives. And the great thing about it is, is that God's plan will bring us joy and will cause us to rejoice because God made us particularly for the plan that He has for us. And so the way in which He makes us he makes us so that we can carry out that which he has called us to do. And because he's made us that way and he's called us that way, that's what brings us joy. So when you follow the Lord and you follow the way in which God wants you to live and you go and you do what God calls you to do, you will rejoice. Sometimes I think we don't rejoice because we're not doing what God wants us to do. Sometimes we can't rejoice because as what Paul warned us in the first passage of the scripture is, is that we're idle. We're not doing the things that God calls us to do. But if you do what God calls you to do in the way in which God has made you and gifted you, that's what will bring you joy. 
And it's what will bring you to his feet in thanksgiving. We still have hope and purpose in our life because of his plans are higher and they're greater than any plans that you could ever have for your own life. God could take you places and give you experiences beyond your comprehension because he has a plan for you and we are to give thanks. We also should not only give thanks because of his, his uh, having a plan for us, but also his presence. We read this morning in our call to worship, Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in our trouble. He's there. He's constantly with us. His presence is with us. His presence is with us in his spirit. When Jesus ascended back into heaven, God sent his spirit and his presence to minister to us. And, and so Psalm 46 says, not only is he our refuge, not only is he present when we're in trouble, is he also says, never fear, therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of sea, though the waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Don't fear. Even if the world looks like it's falling apart, do not fear. God is our refuge, and he is present right now. In all the circumstances of fear and failure, God is with us in his unchanging presence. Psalm 48, verse 8 says, In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Psalm 32, 7, You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Psalm 21, a Psalm of David, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? God is with us. God is present. Not only does he have a plan for our life, but he is present in our life because our God is great. And we should be rejoicing in him. And we should be forever praying to him. And we should be ever thankful to him. And also God is a provider. We should be thankful that God is a provider for us. He is the best giver of any giver ever. He provides all of our needs. Not always our wants, but all of our needs in this life. He provides. And we should be thankful this morning. We should be thankful no matter who we are of how God provides for us. How he provides for us. And he provided one thing for us, and that is the greatest gift ever. And that is the gift of his son. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from heaven, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation, no shadow due to change. The best of God's gift is obviously Jesus, his Son, through whom we can receive salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. He is the great provider with a great gift. And that gift is in 2 Corinthians 5.18 was to reconcile us with God, to bring us back together, to bring back what was separated and unite together so that we can be reconciled with God. Jesus Christ is a perfect, all-encompassing gift from God for anyone that believes, as John 3.16 says. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Again, a God who is a giver, a God who is provider. Second Peter, we've gone through Peter, First Peter, but in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 2 to 3, say, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of the Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and to godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. God in his divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life 
and life abundantly and life eternally. And he has provided and granted to us all things that are for godliness through Jesus Christ. God has provided salvation for those who will believe. God has given the believer the assurance that anything he or she needs, again, notice that needs. You know what the great thing about God is? Not only does he provide for all of our needs, but he also gives us a lot of our wants too. Not all of them, but he does. He blesses us because he's a God who provides. Matthew 7, 7 to 8 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. God provides salvation to those he calls. The Bible says that if you knock, if, if he knocks and you open, he will let you in. The other thing, too, as we talk about salvation, one of the things that we should be very grateful for this morning it is not only does God provide, not, not only is he present, but he is also a God of grace. Grace is the unmerited favor of God that's poured out upon his people. And it was his grace, his precious gift of God's grace, the bedrock of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. As Ephesians 2 and verse 8 says, for by grace you have been saved. You have been saved by the unmerited favor of God. We didn't deserve to be saved. We didn't deserve to have Jesus come to this earth. We didn't deserve Jesus to die on the cross, but it was freely given to us by the grace of God himself. The whole world ought to give gratitude to God for his love that made him send Jesus, his only begotten son, into this world to convey grace and salvation through grace. That is something to be praiseworthy this morning. That is something to be thankful for if you're in Christ Jesus this morning. It is something, as, as we mentioned last week when we talked about the gospel, the good news of Jesus for a Christian, it should be vibrant. It should make us alive. It should make us be thankful. It should make us and drive us to prayer that was without time gap, never ceasing. And in that, we will rejoice and be glad because we are constantly reminded of how much God loves us and how much he cares for us and how much he protects us. John 1, 14, 16 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus became flesh. Jesus the Word. Jesus the truth. And dwelt among us. Walked on this earth. And it says, And we have seen His glory. The glory as the only Son from the Father, who is what? Full of grace and truth. For from His fullness we have received grace upon grace. Oh, how God blesses us. Oh God, how he pours out his grace upon grace, his unmerited favor upon other unmerited favors, the blessing of God. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 11 to 14, for the grace of God has appeared, Jesus, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passion and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself us, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are what? Who are zealous for good works, who are zealous to serve the Lord. Unmerited favor, salvation, bringing us to him, the great shepherd calling out to his sheep and his sheep know his voice and hear his voice and they come and they follow him. And as we follow him, we renounce ungodliness, we renounce worldly passions, we renounce the living for this world. And instead, we are called to have self-control, we're called to be upright, we're called to be godly lives in the present day and age in which we live. And all that we say and all that we do. How are you doing about that this week? 
How are you doing in self-control? How are you doing in being upright for God? How are you doing in living a godly life in your present age, in your present location, in your present home, in your present job, in your present group of friends? Oh, how God is a God of giving and how we should be so thankful for all that he provides. And as we are thankful, we bring that to him. We bring it before his throne and we thank him constantly in prayer. Again, it brings us back to Thursday night. All that we do, we should do for the glory of God. And if we do it for the glory of God, we should be forever thanking God for all that he does for us. All that he does constantly. And as we are thankful and as we bring it in prayer, oh, how we should rejoice. How we should rejoice in the great God because our God is great. John 15, verse 13 and 14, greater love has no one than this, that someone would lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you to do. You ever notice that in Scripture? We are saved by grace, but the evidence of being saved and coming to true faith is the evidence of how we live. In other words, greater love has no one, greater love, God, no one has greater love than God that he would send his only begotten son to come down here and die for his friends. How do you know he's your friend? If you do what I command, if you are obedient and you follow me, that's the evidence. We owe Jesus Christ a huge debt of gratitude for what he has done to make salvation possible for each and one, every one of us. Thanks to Jesus should be on our forefront of our mind at all times in prayer, praying without ceasing, continual prayer that we might have communion with the Father through Christ Jesus being led by His Spirit. Oh, how great our God is and how thankful we should be. I think sometimes the, the reason we're, we're not praying as we ought is, is because we think that prayer is just something that we ask for. In other words, when we come up against struggles or if we have friends that are covered, we come before God and all we do is we pray for those things. And yes, we can bring those. We can bring, we can bring our, our thoughts and our, and our prayers and circumstances before God and pray for them, but that not ought to be the bulk of our prayers. The bulk of our prayers should be prayers of thanksgiving. For our God is great. Oh, how great our God is. We're going to end this morning with singing that song how great is our God. Let us rejoice in the splendor of our King this morning. Let us rejoice in the fact that he clothed in majesty. Let us rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. Age to age he stands, the Alpha and the Omega, the before and the forevermore, the Godhead three in one, Father, Son, Spirit, the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, this morning as we await the return of Jesus, as we re await the return of Jesus, and with all the things that are going on in this world, as Christians, you can't help but think that we are living in the end times when Jesus will return, and it seems like he'll return sooner rather than later. Paul would say to us this morning, don't be idle. Submit to the leadership Make sure that we're working for the Lord in all that we do, whether it's our jobs or whether it's work in the kingdom. Rejoice. Don't repay evil for evil, but love one another. Do good to everyone. And in that rejoice, rejoice, pray without ceasing, and give thanks.